So as a conductor, without a doubt, this is the number one question that I get asked all the time when I'm chit-chatting with someone I don't know about what it's like being a conductor or the things that you have to learn. And it makes sense that you would be curious about whether a person that stands in front of so many instruments and tells them what to do needs to, in fact, be able to play all those instruments. So to answer the question, does a conductor need to play all of the instruments in an orchestra? No, no, he or she does not. Don't make them do that. There are a lot of instruments. So that's the video for today. I hope you enjoyed it. Subscribe and all of that. Bye. Having said that, what I want to tell you guys in this video are the things that conductors do really need to know about the instruments. And I'm going to be very specific about strings and woodwinds because there are some things that it's essential that a conductor truly understands in order to do their job well. So for the strings, the thing that a conductor really needs to understand very, very well are the bowings. So if you don't know anything about a string instrument, you know they have the bow. And obviously there's two directions in which a bow can go, up or down. You can play one note, you know, one note, one note. You can play a lot of notes as you go up and then a lot of notes as you go down. But what I mean to say with the bowings is, you know, up and down. And actually this movement has a graphic representation. This is how you write bow up and this is how you write bow down. Why is this important? Because both the action of going up and down and the actual weight that is involved in those two movements is very different. There's a frog in the bow and that makes one end be heavier than the other. Also, obviously going like this, you know, you have the force of gravity going with you and going like this is against it. So for the performer, this can produce a very different sound or a very different idea of what the phrasing is. And so it's very common, I would almost say, you know, normal and expected for a conductor to change all the bowings in order for that to be closer to the version that you already know you want. If you already know you want three notes very accentuated, it might be worth writing all of them going down. So you have weight in the three of them equally instead of having perhaps weight, a bit less weight and weight. Of course, if you have amazing players, they can you know, counteract this whole weight issue and make three notes sound the same, but it might be quicker to get all of them going down and you know, you get the effect. And obviously, and this is very important, all the players need to play the same. You can't have people, someone going up and someone going down. That's, that's, that, that is a real no-no. So to illustrate this in a very, very clear way, I got two scores out of the New York Philharmonic Archives. It's an online website where you can get scores that have been marked by different conductors or performers. It's free, it's an amazing resource. And I got two scores for the second violin for Beethoven 7. One says that it's marked by Bernstein and the other one, I'm not sure. But what I wanna show you guys is that for the same notes, there's two different versions of the Boeings that both conductors wanted. It doesn't matter that you understand exactly what this means, but what I wanted to show you is how a very, very small phrase, albeit very important, is the beginning of Beethoven 7, can have a very different set of bows depending again on what the conductor decided. So for the winds, both woodwinds and brass, what I will say is that these groups are much more diverse than the strings because on the strings, really, you have max four instruments, but with woodwinds, you have a lot of instruments, flute, oboe, clarinet, bassoon, if we talk about brass, trumpet, etc. And they all have very different, they all look very different. Their mouthpieces are different. The way that they produce sound is very different. And so here, it's not so much about knowing about specific techniques, but you do need to know about register and dynamic. This means that for every instrument, you need to know what the range is, what the actual notes, the lowest and the highest notes are that they can play, and what the dynamic possibilities are for each range. What do I mean by this? There's instruments that on the higher register, they can't play soft because the the pressure that they need to produce is so high that it's just gonna shoot a very, very high pitched loud sound and there's not a lot that you can do with that. On the contrary, for example, some instruments like the clarinet have a lot of dynamic range. They're one of the only instruments 
woodwinds that can start from zero because they really can control a lot the dynamics with which they play but not all instruments can do this so this is important because if you have a passage and you feel the balance is off maybe you don't need to ask the flute to play less because they can't maybe you need to ask everybody else to play a bit more maybe you have to think about it in some other way depending on what the possibilities for each instrument is. Again, if the piece is composed brilliantly, probably the composer already had this in mind and wrote for each instrument things that are possible and sound good and dynamic ranges and, you know, fortes and pianos for the instruments that can play fortes and pianos in those notes. And then there's a bunch of other things that you really need to understand not so much to, you know, get your version to come across, but so that you can work with each performer the best. Before we can get to that, I actually forgot to mention something really important that conductors must understand very well, and it has to do with transposing instruments. These are instruments where what is written is not necessarily what it sounds like, but the reason why I forgot to mention this is because I'm already working on a video specifically about this topic because it is mind-bending craziness. So having said that, on with the video. For example, horns. It's very difficult for the horns to produce sound. They need to control their breath. They need to control the shape of the mouth. They can change the pitch with the shape, the pressure of the mouth. If the instrument is hot or cold because the environment is hot or cold, changes a lot of things. So it is very, it's an, it's an instrument that's very hard is what I'm trying to say. So, you know, it's known that you need to take a bit more care if you're giving entrances to horns, perhaps give them with a slightly bit more time, you know, don't sort of throw yourself on them as you're cueing them or, you know, if need be, perhaps breathe with them so that they can sort of enter the sound in the psychologically in the best way possible. Now for the instrument that most conductors do play, I would say that like, 80% of conductors play the piano. And there's two reasons for this. One is that nowadays they ask you to. Most university programs have a piano audition because the idea is that if you play the piano, then you're able to play piano reductions of the pieces that you're going to conduct. And that means that you can study them in a much more tangible way before you get to the orchestra. You can play the harmonies, you can play the different lines, you can experiment with tempo instead of imagining it in your head, you can actually produce it and then try and reproduce that in the orchestra. Having said that, I know many, many excellent conductors that don't play the piano, just have a great sound imagination, a great you know, they can hear the harmonies and they figure it out some other way. The second reason why a lot of conductors play the piano is because a very typical path into conducting is to start accompanying singers and then get a job as a repetiteur in an opera theater. And sometimes those positions come with some conducting duties and then that leads to you being more of a full-time conductor. It's also very common for violinists to either go into conducting or do both things, especially the ones that have done you know, the position of concertmeister or first violin, because that's a position that has a lot of leadership responsibilities. And some violinists and pianists have been known for conducting and playing at the same time, playing the piano and then throwing a cue here or there, or, you know, conducting from the violin, which really these two things are where conducting is from, are where conducting was born, because before the figure of the conductor, the first violin or the cembalist would sort of play and at the same time conduct. As orchestras got bigger and bigger, the figure of a person that their only job is to conduct was born. All right, that is enough for me today. I hope this answered your question. I will read you in the comments if you have anything else you'd like to ask and I will see you next time.